Well, thank you everybody for coming today. I uh, appreciate you all taking the time to, to hear my little speech. Um, so I work at Sonos. Sonos is based in Santa Barbara and in Boston. We also have offices in China and Europe and, and so on. And we're a loudspeaker company. So we design, uh, how should I say, powered wireless r loudspeakers, which means that uh, each of these products that you see on the screen here has uh, a lot of technical challenges to them. There's a power supply inside, there's a router inside, there's a little computer inside. You have to actually manage user interface. Um, there's a software interface that allows you to talk to the speakers from your phone. Um, and of course, there's the stuff inside that's actually supposed to be making the sound, which is what my team is actually responsible for. And um, our customers expect that uh, things just kind of work when it comes out of the box and they don't have to really worry about it because that's what consumer products are normally expected to do. Our products uh, create a wireless mesh network and you can stream audio from co you know, companies like Spotify or Apple Music or what, uh, whatever you'd like. Um, and they just expect to like, you know, click a few buttons on your phone and out comes uh, Adele or whatever it is that you actually like. Um, and so, uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is some of the stuff that, uh, some of the work that my team works on to design the products uh, in order to make sure that they're reliable. Uh, it, it, a lot of times we'll come to presentations like at these kind of venues and we'll talk about how to design stuff so that you get the best performance possible. But uh, in this case, we're going to talk about reliability and just give you an idea as to the complexity of what's going on in here. This is one of the speakers. Uh, we took it apart, and those are all the little parts that are inside there. So it's a lot of different things that you're actually trying to put together and make work. So uh, as I said, my team is responsible for transducer function and operation. We design the things that actually make the sound. Um, they're supposed to be making the sound, as opposed to the other things that might be in there that buzz and no one wants to hear. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how transducers actually work. Uh, the point of the transducer is to convert an electrical input signal, create an outgoing pressure wave, which gets to our listener, and they hear, again, Adele, hopefully, um, and not something bad. Um, so in terms of like how the transducers function, let me talk a, a little bit about the parts that are inside. Um, we've got a few different classes of parts. We have the transducer motor parts, which uh, are, you know, kind of denoted by uh, the items uh, one on the screen, uh, a voice coil, which is item number two here, which is a coil of fine wire, which is uh, uh, basically located within the motor structure. Uh, we have some suspension elements that are suspending the coil and the diaphragm. Uh, the diaphragm itself, its purpose is actually to push on the air and create the outgoing pressure wave. And then we have a support structure, which is the basket, um, sometimes it's known as the frame. And that holds everything together and also allows the transducer to be installed into the overall loudspeaker system. Um, so uh, again, classes of parts, moving parts um, or soft parts or the diaphragm, spider, surround and voice coil, the hard parts or the motor components and the basket. Um, so how does this work? Um, essentially, um, there, you know, it's a transducer. It's converting uh, electrical input into sound. Uh, through three stages. You've got a magnetic motor system which runs off of, uh, it's a basically we're running a Lorentz force motor. Um, so anybody remembers the right hand rule from way back when you were in school, that's essentially how it works. Um, you've got current running through a field, a magnetic field, and that generates a force in a direction which is uh, perpendicular to both the, um, the current and the magnetic field orientation. Um, and so that's, that acts on the current that's running through the voice coil. The mechanical spring system is the, you know, basically you've got a coil and the diaphragm which are attached together, um, mounted on the spring suspension elements and that's basically moving up and, up and down. Um, and then you've got your pressure generation system which is your diaphragm is pushing on the air and creating your outgoing pressure wave. And so I drew a nice free body diagram for those of you who remember what those are um, to kind of illustrate the point because pictures actually are usually an easier way to describe things. Um, and so yeah, essentially that's, you know, the, the thought process we're going through is actually how to uh, normally optimize all of those things to create performance. Um, but 
uh, we also have to make sure it's going to work and last. And so we go through a predictive design process to make sure that things are going to be durable. Um, so in general, we do a lot of simulations. We want to make sure that uh, uh, we get improved accuracy of our prototypes versus our goals and expectations. Um, we do a lot of virtual prototyping to evaluate different design options. And then, of course, we're trying to go faster uh, and faster and get stuff to the market and out to people who are actually trying to listen to Adele, um, you know, uh, more quickly. So, uh, you know, and thus, you know, we're cutting out a lot of build and try type prototyping that when I started in the industry 20, 25 years ago, um, that's a lot of what people did. Is you put stuff together and try it and it didn't work and then you curse and swear and so on. Um, and then try and fix it, right? So in terms of how we approach simulation, we do uh, two different classes of simulation. We simulate an electroacoustic function that's basic performance, which we're doing off of an uh, electroacoustic circuit modeling, um, which we do a lot in MATLAB. Um, and then we take a look at transducer and component function performance through COMSOL. Um, we look at magnetics performance, uh, structural performance and durability, and soft parts performance and durability. And, and we're going to go through uh, a couple of examples. Durability here comes into play because we're talking about fatigue life of moving components. Uh, you don't want to have your diaphragm moving up and down and then suddenly break into pieces because then you don't get to hear Adele. Um, you've got environmental conditions that you have to deal with. It can be hot, cold. You might be having your speaker out by the ocean side and getting salt spray on stuff. Uh, humidity can be in play. Lots of stuff can be going on there. And then you've got to deal with user handling. Um, so I have a six-year-old daughter. Hi, Sydney. Um, she'll get to see the video someday. And, uh, uh, you know, she's six years old. She could knock the speaker off of the coffee table by accident. She's never done this. <laughs> um, but it could happen. And then you also have to kind of cope with, like, you know, your shipping products these days. Amazon ships everything by FedEx or UPS or whatever it is. And those guys are not necessarily the most gentle people in the world. I'm sure you all are familiar with this problem. And your boxes show up a little bit dented. And yet the consumer is expecting that they still open up the box and the thing just works. Um, so you have to kind of design to deal with those kinds of situations. So. I'm going to go through a couple of examples, um, just kind of illustrate how we approach this kind of stuff. So first, I'm going to go through uh, the non-moving components, to make sure that uh, stuff doesn't get broken by uh, the courtesy of UPS. Um, so the non-moving parts have stresses acting upon them that are you know, due to handling. Uh, people drop stuff. There's a lot of vibration that's going on during transportation. Um, and um, the weakest part of the transducer typically in this context is the basket. You've got it's attached to the cabinet, which is usually nice and rigid, and it's got a big heavy motor hanging off the back of it, and so, and, and it's usually nice and thin. Um, and, and, you know, there are reasons for that. We're trying to optimize for cost, not put any more money into the part than we need to. Um, and so, you know, the choice of the basket material and geometry is a key part of the design process to make sure that it's actually going to be robust in this, in this context. So I'm going to walk through a bit of an example where we had a design and we were basically evaluating material selection for this basket, which kind of, uh, which grade of steel we were expecting to select um, and work with our supply base to actually obtain in order to make this product work. So uh, we... Uh, uh, had a basic um, working model of what the stresses would be like, and we modeled it as a 50G mechanical shock, which is like a half sine pulse at a uh, 11 millisecond pulse width. Um, based upon prior experience, this is pretty typical, but it's something you always have to kind of go through and validate with each individual loudspeaker design. Um, and so it was basically a good mimic for, hey, I dropped it off of a certain height uh, kind of impact. Um, and so we used COMSOL. We did a mechanical time-dependent analysis, imported the uh, basket model in from CAD. We it, you know, basically uh, put a mass load on the back of the basket to mimic um, the weight of the motor. And then we applied the acceleration to the mounting surface where it would be attached to the cabinet. And that's what you actually you can see in the pictures here. Um, 
here's that mounting surface in blue up here in the upper right um, where we're applying the acceleration and then you know, down here in the lower right we're showing where we basically tacked on the mass of the motor um, in a rather uh, dense mess because we have a nice fancy computer we could get, actually get away with using a nice dense mesh. Um, so what I'm going to show here is um, uh, the high, you know, where the high stress concentrations are and I'm going to basically use the <clears throat> display function which only shows the data that's in range. And so I, what I'm going to do is actually step through a number of slides here where I'm showing uh, where I've contracted the range to simulate uh, reduction in yield stress uh, for the grades of steel we're talking about. So here we're showing a yield stress of 170 megapascals for the steel and you can see that the basket's all there. Um, at 160 megapascals, there's this little corner that's kind of disappeared from view, and it's just going to get worse as we step through this. If that corner is starting to disappear a little bit more, and a little bit more at 140 megapascals, 130 megapascals, it's you know really starting to kind of disappear on you in that location. 120 megapascals, it's starting to eat away at the overall column of steel in this location, and. 110 megapascals, you're, you know, so now at this point you've got, uh, it's really undercutting on both sides and another corner is starting to go, um, 100 megapascals. I think at this point you would probably conclude that uh, um, the, the entire column is basically buckled and collapsed due to the shock because now you, you see that the material is actually missing from view. Uh, and it's much worse at 90 megapascals. And so our, our basic conclusion was we liked the, uh, or we were comfortable using 130 megapascals as the targeted yield stress because we looked at what the structural integrity was and this column of steel which I highlighted earlier, um, it maintained its integrity at this level. Um, now this comes across of course like I have no design margin built into this. Of course, we're not really expecting that people are going around daily knocking their speakers off of their coffee tables. You should really talk to your child if that's what's going on. Or you know, they're not shipping your speaker every day by FedEx, right? So it's not a cyclical load. Um, you're just expecting that it's going to work. People know that if they've knocked their speakers off of the coffee table, they've done something that's kind of wrong. You do want it to kind of survive that. Um, they drop it from this height. They really know that they've done something that's kind of stupid. If they drop it from way down here, they think it should be able to survive, and you're trying to engineer for that. Um, we could have done other things. We could have gone with thicker steel, which would have cost more money, or we could have changed to a different plastic material, and that has other implications. For us, this was a, a good working engineering compromise. So, um, and this is a pretty typical analysis that we would actually do through this design process. Now I'm going to talk a little bit different example for the moving components. We're going to talk about a speaker um, which we had to design where the speaker is actually flat. So here's a nice flat speaker that's in designed to sit underneath your television. Um, so it's a TV speaker kind of product. Um, so it's nice and shallow um, because the speaker is shallow, the, the woofer is shallow. Um, and that made the diaphragm basically being designed as essentially flat for a good part of it, which means that if you look at the cross section here, this is the nice little tiny voice coil that's applying uh, force on the diaphragm. And there's going to be a lot of stress in this area where that attachment is um, because there's no geometric reinforcement from the shape of the diaphragm itself. It's just a flat oil candy kind of shape. Um, and so we simulated, you know, basically a basic let's displace out the cone to we think it should be designed to move this far. And lo and behold, yes, these stresses are very high. Uh, you know, you can see this red section right here um, where the voice call is attached. And that's, you know, it was high enough that we were concerned that with the appropriate level of design margin that this section would eventually fatigue and fail. Um, and so we took a look at various design options and it's a very challenging metallic part that we've got here. So we couldn't just go around making the steel thicker. Um, we had to look at what we could do and we actually settled on what seems like a kind of a common sense thing which we <clears throat> patented. Um, we, uh, 
we glued on a, a secondary um, ring, which we punched out of uh, flat sheet stock of aluminum, and basically glued it on to reinforce the area, and that was highly sufficient. To, and you can see the picture here versus the picture on the previous screen. Same scale for the amount of stress that's going on here, and all the stress has basically disappeared here. Um, and this gave us a lot of comfort. We were very concerned that we would you know, be releasing millions of these a year and, and huge numbers of them could come back from the field and all the customers would be unhappy and we'd be unhappy and bad things would happen. Um, and so this was a great solution. It was easy to manufacture, negligible cost impact because it's a small part. And it was so small that the weight impact had no real uh, concerns for us in terms of the acoustic performance impact. So again, this is a, a great way of uh, investigating the durability of your product um, as opposed to just designing for performance. Um, and that's something that has been very important for us. We want our products to last 10 years out there in the field uh, under normal usage. So um, that's, you know, to, to conclude and wrap this up, um, we've really deployed Comsol a lot to do this kind of analysis. It's very effective for us. Um, the biggest vulnerability we find is uh, the limited amount of material property information which is available from our supply base. So we, you guys probably have similar problems. Um, a lot of our suppliers, they don't really know what they have. Now, you, we show up and we try and buy parts and uh, they probably get one question a year from us and you know, out, out of all of their customers basically asking, so what are the material properties? And so they don't, you know, they're small companies. They don't hire a material scientist to basically sit around waiting for that once a year question. They just supply what you ask for. So we've had to take on a certain level of responsibility to understand what the materials really are and do testing. We bought an Instron. And we do... Uh, you know, analysis, you know, measurements to figure out what the yield strengths are and, uh, and so on, so as to build up a database. What we f do understand is a, a trying to actually build up a fatigue life curve um, database would take, you know, for the fatigue um, cycles that we're looking at in operation, would take years and years and years. And we really can't um, stop releasing products on that time scale. So um, we go with the design margin approach where, where that seems more appropriate for us. So I think that's it for me. Please, if you've got questions.